What's going on everybody? I'm Jory Goodman, The Time Teller. So guys, we might not agree on everything. We might have differing opinions once in a while and that's perfectly fine. But I think one thing we can agree on is that watch collecting is a pretty dang good time or else we wouldn't be doing it. But what about vintage watch collecting? Cause that's like a whole new animal, right? Totally different beast. There's a whole lot of things to take into consideration. There's a whole lot of things to know. There's a whole lot of questions to ask. So where do you begin? Well guys, all these things buzzing around my head as I remember what it was like to start vintage watch collecting is kind of what led me here today with my own vintage watch shop. You see, I'm trying to help as much as possible mitigate that fear and confusion of vintage watch collecting by answering as many questions as possible and giving you guys the best products at the time teller shop. But clearly that's not enough because I keep getting a ton of questions about how I first got into vintage watch collecting specifically. So I figured why not make an entirely dedicated episode to this. So here's everything I wish I knew before buying a vintage watch. Now, I'm wearing one of my vintage watches right now, my Musta Cartier Tank. I actually made an episode dedicated to this watch a very long time ago. Uh, I have full box and papers. I unboxed it and showed you guys it. And uh, it's actually the only episode on my channel that's still to this day fully demonetized because the title is Size Matters. <laughs> But okay, enough messing around. Let's go ahead and talk about everything I wish I knew before buying a freaking vintage watch. It's 8.24 p.m. Let's get down to business. Guys, I got the dreaded pen out because I'm gonna be doing this fairly archaic uh, by checking things off a list. Wow, every time I have this in my hand, people get so angry. Oh, <laughs> you're just showing off your blank. All right, first things first, first on the list, Take your time, guys. That goes for anything, but especially when it comes to vintage watch collecting, you know, uh, don't impulse buy. Don't buy the first thing you see because as we get further down on the list, you're gonna find some things you really need to take into consideration and you're gonna wish you waited a bit. Which brings me to the next point. Uh, do all your homework before pulling the trigger on a watch. So you know, we're fairly laid back on this channel. We try to have fun. We don't take ourselves too seriously here. Uh, typically, I would tell you, you know, when you're getting into the watch scene, you don't really need to be a reference number fiend. Like I know there's a bunch of other media sites. There's maybe some other YouTube channels that are very, very reference number heavy. And that's all well and good. I like knowing my reference numbers, but here, you know, for the most part, you don't need to know a ton different reference numbers but when it comes to vintage watch collecting you do okay and here's why um things differ greatly uh, sometimes even amongst the same reference number, but also uh, different companies have made so many different watches, you really need to know the nuances of each specific reference. I'm looking at you, Omega. You made way too many watches uh, throughout the years, for sure. Very, very confusing, vintage Omega. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. So for sure, before you buy a vintage watch, before you pull the trigger on it, please make sure you're brushed up on those reference numbers, especially of the one that you're buying. So guys, why do I want you to know your reference numbers? Is it because I wanna rub my knowledge in your face and hold it over your head and say, <laughs> you don't know as much as me. You better get on my level before you buy vintage watches like me. No guys, it's because not everyone is honest out there, okay? And not everyone has your best interest in mind when they're selling you a watch. So to protect yourself, before you buy a certain watch, make sure you know a lot about that reference number and a lot about that specific year. We're gonna talk about that in the next point um, because there's a lot of Franken watches out there there and there's a lot of straight up inauthentic vintage watches out there. And so this all brings us to the next point, which I just alluded to, know your years, okay? Not just the reference numbers, understand the years, because I made an episode titled Proof, you need to ask questions before buying a vintage Rolex, and I showcased two of my Rolex dates, okay? Both of them shared the same reference number, the reference number 1500. One is a stainless steel date with uh, no quick set date, no hacking, and a lower beat movement. Uh, that's one that I've had, it's actually my first Rolex ever that I've owned. Uh, and then the next one was a two-tone black dial date 1500 that had a higher beat movement. 
movement had Quickset at, and hacking, excuse me. And I actually recently got that one serviced and gave it to my dad. But guys, uh, if you're looking for a specific watch, sometimes even amongst the same reference number they change. So again, know the reference number, but also understand the years because the black dial two-tone with the hacking, the quick set, and the higher beat movement, that's obviously a more modern watch. And then the older one, uh, my fully stainless steel, uh, lower beat, no quick set, no hacking date, again, same reference number, but it's a much earlier number, much earlier year, excuse me. Now I got myself confused. So guys, remember how earlier in the episode I said that Omega made way too many watches throughout the years? I'm serious because earlier I used to believe that Vintage Omega was like the best place to start when it comes to vintage watch collecting. I'm changing my mind on that now. I think ever since I started my own vintage watch shop, I've seen a ton of the Vintage Omegas out there and I'm like, whoa. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you're not used to the vintage watch market, it's not really a good place to start. There's just way too many reference numbers, way too many deviation within each reference number, way too many models per year, and there's just no consistency throughout their product line when we look at any specific year. Throughout the 60s to 80s, there were a ton of random Omegas like just churned out. So again, for someone who's not familiar with buying vintage watches in the first place, they can get really burned if they don't know what they're doing because a lot of the Omegas I see people take pictures of and ask me about, they're like, hey, time teller, this one looks really cool. Should I pull the trigger on it? I look at it and it has just a fake dial or a really badly redone dial and then who knows what's going on inside the watch case and then yada, yada, yada. And um, yeah, just steer clear of vintage Omega until you really know what you want, until you really know what you're doing. And guys, actually something I just thought of that I want to kind of uh, add to the end of this point, um, 1020 movements, okay, the Omega 1020 movement, it's a beautiful movement and it has a very smooth sweep, day-date complication, automatic, uh, gorgeous, right? Well, it's very, very finicky, all right? I own a beautiful integrated bracelet 1020 Seamaster. Um, I love that watch and uh, it's got it clean as a whistle inside that movement. Um, and luckily, I keep that thing on a winder because I understand how finicky that movement is. When that movement dies and you go to reset the day-date complication and the time, that's where the gears can sometimes slip and kind of bind and then maybe grind and then they get uh, just destroyed in there and then it's a headache having to get a new movement or get it fixed and then yada, yada, yada. So steer clear of the 1020 movement if you're looking at a vintage Omega like mine, uh, unless, uh, you know, there's some sort of guarantee, some sort of valid, uh, what, what am I looking for? Service history, thank you. <laughs> And unless you can verify that that watch is actually in pristine, really good working condition, yeah, I would not recommend uh, a 1020 movement. All right, next point. We're gonna kind of keep this train going. I mentioned Omega, vintage Omega, maybe steer clear if you're first starting out. Well, there's another watch manufacturer that I absolutely love that I think you probably shouldn't start out with if you're new to the vintage watch market, Seiko. All right, I'm a Seiko fanboy. I'm, that's what you guys accuse me of being in the comment section at least. Well, vintage Seiko is not a good place to start out with because uh, there's way too many Franken watches, all right? A lot of kind of uh, watchmaker hobbyists, people that just love tinkering around with watches, uh, they find these very prevalent Seiko parts they put them together and then boom, you got yourself a Franken watch, but they don't always disclose that in their listings and they end up inadvertently maybe taking advantage of someone who sees a really nice Seiko 6139. Oh my God, first automatic chronograph, it's gorgeous, time teller, look. And then I look at it and it's very clearly unoriginal, but again, they've spent a lot of money on it and so then they end up getting burned. Another thing that is really not great about Seiko, and, and it's not just the 6139s, okay? It's the Bellmatics, it's uh, some of the World Times, it's some of the really cool watches that are vintage, that are hard to find, but you see them a whole lot on eBay because they're just put together by sourced uh, random parts. But okay, Seiko 6139, that's probably the most abused out of that category, but what about the vintage Seiko divers? Okay, I'm gonna tell you to stay away from those as well, not only because there's a good chance that it's a Franken watch, but because even if it's fully authentic and original, the prices are redonkulous, okay? And it's kind of because of all the fakes that, or, or I should say Franken watches that are out there. I, I kind of hesitate saying fake, 
when we're talking about Franken watches because usually they're made with uh, like real Seiko parts. It's just they're just not original, right? It's just kind of an amalgamation. Uh, um, Frankenstein. I know there's going to be some wizard in the comment section. Well, it's not technically Frankenstein. No, you're referring to Frankenstein's monster because everybody thinks that Frankenstein's the green monster that's been put together by a bunch of body parts. But really, that's Frankenstein, the doctor scientist's monster. I don't know how the... <laughs> Look at me. We don't care. But as I was saying, um, these really high prices for the original vintage Seikos um, are due a lot to the Franken watch for Seikos because when someone has a really nice all original vintage Seiko diver or an all original vintage Seiko 6139, they see all these other fakes that are on the market and they're like, well, I'm not one. I have an all original one. I'm going to I'm going to sell this at a premium. So. Yeah, huge bummer, but I'm gonna tell you to steer clear until you really know what you want. So guys, I get it. The last two points were kind of negative, telling you to stay away from Omega, telling you to stay away from Seiko, two companies I absolutely love and personally own. But the next point, it's a silver lining, if you will, okay? Because here's the deal. Uh, when we look at the vintage watch market, there's a bunch of watch manufacturers that actually came together for a period of time and made some really cool watches that you can scoop up with fairly good ease. First up, Zenith and Movado. Now, I'm not a huge fan of what Movado's been doing recently, and uh, again, recently, I kind of think that Zenith is messing up, so fairly disappointing because they're a really cool company. But way back when, in the years of yore, they came together and they made some beautiful watches, some really sporty retro chronographs, some gorgeous, elegant tanks. I actually recently had a Zenith Movado tank at the Time Teller shop. That thing got scooped up right away. Just beautiful watches that you can find fairly easily. And uh, yeah, again, Zenith Movado, win-win. And another one that I absolutely have to harp on, the Longines Wittenauer, okay? So Wittenauer nowadays is owned by Bulova, who has since ran them into the ground. Screw you, Bulova. But way back when, Longines acquired Wittenauer and made some of the most gorgeous vintage watches ever. Hands down, vintage Longines made Wittenauer is my favorite vintage watch to collect. They are gorgeous, kind of art deco-y, funky, with bomb-proof movements. Um, again, you're getting the beauty of Longines and you're getting just kind of the reliability of a Wittenauer. It's, it's just amazing. They made gorgeous watches together and I'm very happy about that because we can find them, again, with relative ease. And um, I've, I've been very lucky to source some of the most beautiful examples for the Time Teller shop. And uh, yeah, if you're looking at where to start, I would say find yourself a vintage Longines made uh, Wittenauer, excuse me, and uh, have yourself a good time. All right, which brings us to the next point. When people sometimes think vintage, they think that automatically equals affordable, and that's very inaccurate because not every vintage watch is as affordable as a modern watch. Okay, perfect example of this is Certina. A lot of modern Certinas, they're great watches. You know, you can get them with Powermatic 80 movements. They're made by Swatch Group. And uh, yeah, a lot of them, you can have them for, you know, under a thousand dollars. When we look at vintage Certina, especially their chronographs and stuff, uh, boy, those are a pretty penny. Every time you find one complete to come to auction, they fetch very high prices. So you gotta be careful, okay? Not every vintage watch is affordable in comparison to its modern counterpart. Now guys, here's the next point I wanna make, okay? And this is gonna get me in some hot water and people are gonna be like, <laughs> obviously. I had to look at myself on the monitor because my my uh, my toupee was falling off. <laughs> Crisis averted. I put a little bit more duct tape on there, some Gorilla Glue and oh boy, we're looking good. But seriously, the next point I wanted to make is that uh, you can't be scared to ask questions, okay? Some people when they're purchasing things, uh, they're a little bit too bashful. They're just like, oh, um, I, 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 I don't mean to be a bother, but um, is this watch fake? Is it fake? You can tell me if it's. F well, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. Guys, speak up, okay? Speak up. Don't be scared to ask questions. I get questions, hundreds of them a day, and I'm not kidding. Look at my Instagram. Uh, I get a ton of questions, and people get mad when I don't respond. Like immediately. Now, what are you, my mother? But seriously, guys, ask questions. Ask about those years. Ask about those reference numbers. Hey, the handset might look not, doesn't look like what you thought it would look like. Hey, uh, inquire about it. Come on, speak today, Junior. And guys, guess what? 
Ask for pictures if you want to. Ask about the service history. If the seller is not willing or if the seller seems perturbed or put off by your questions, don't spend your money with them. Guys, you're buying the seller more than you're buying the watch, right? And that's what I'm trying to mitigate by having my own store. I am honored and flattered that a lot of you guys trust me and trust my word, and that's why I'm trying to find the best products for you at the Time Teller shop. I know this sounds like a shameless plug, but even if you don't purchase a vintage watch from me, please listen up. Don't be scared to ask questions. Purchase the seller, not just the watch. If he seems kind of sleazy, if he seems kind of scummy, if he's trying to shoo you off if he's not answering your questions and he doesn't want to give you the pictures you need and this and that and he's uh, you know giving you the runaround don't spend your hard-earned cash with him it's not worth it which brings me to the next point if the deal is too good to be true it is guys someone a very young watch collector showed up in my DMS on Instagram the other day by the way uh, at the simple consultant that's actually the easiest place to get a hold of me uh, you can write me questions directly into my inbox and uh, again I get about a hundred a day so please bear with me I try to answer everyone I can as they show up um, but again I get a lot of them so um, a younger watch collector I think he's probably in his teens he showed me two uh, Rolex day dates on his wrist and he was like check this out I just bought these babies for 400 bucks and I was like what? Because here's the deal. One of them was two-tone, and I'm not aware of a two-tone day date Rolex. Uh, the other one had a bunch of case back engravings that don't exist from Rolex. Uh, and, um, well, you know what? Let, let, let me just show you some of the pics. Yeah. Yep. Not... The I feel bad because he's probably watching this episode right now. Those aren't even good fakes, okay? They're, the, they're, ter they're terrible. Oh, guys, I'm actually looking at these right now. They're both two-tone day dates. I've never even heard of those. Anyway, they're fake. Now guys, hear me out, because there's gonna be maybe someone who does know a little thing or two about watches that's gonna mention the Day-Date Tridor. That's technically not a two-tone, it's technically a, well, a, a tri-door. Tri sounds like a mythological beast. <laughs> but yeah, I literally, I, I'm gonna Google it right now. I don't know of a, of a two-tone uh, Rolex day date so guys okay we've gone through let me see i think it's like been nine maybe ten things i don't know gato <laughs> count them up for me wow but we've gone through a thing or two on this episode and uh, i hope you've learned something but i'm not done okay um there's one more thing that i want to mention if you're buying vintage by the way it, <laughs> my mont blanc turned into a pink highlighter i'm super talented so guys old jokes aside this is the last thing i want to say and it's super duper important all right you might be a super stud, okay? You've done all your homework, you know all the years, you know that watch inside and out, you know all the reference numbers, you can rattle them off, you know every single nuance that the company ever came out with from this year to that year, you just know everything. But if you're buying that watch from someone who's a little bit shady, you don't know a whole lot about and it kind of gives you a bad vibe, you're still making the wrong decision. You probably still shouldn't be buying the watch, okay? You could be doing everything right, and if the seller is a scumbag, uh, don't, don't do it. So please, if you're gonna be buying a vintage watch, buy from someone who is verified, who has a good reputation. Buy from someone who has some form of guarantee or service warranty. Better off both. Time Teller Shop actually has both of those things, a service warranty and a guarantee. But seriously, check out the Time Teller shop if you so choose, but even if you don't purchase a watch from me, use this list and save yourself some money and save yourself the headache of buying a watch that you probably shouldn't have purchased. But guys, that's all I have to say for you today. If you learned something, if you had a laugh, maybe you just got super duper frustrated and you don't like my beard, still, <laughs> click that thumbs up, click that subscribe button if you haven't already, hit that bell icon because it truly does help us out a ton on this channel. Like, comment, subscribe, share this with everyone you know so they save themselves some money as well. I'm Jory Goodman, the time teller. Always remember, I didn't invent time, I just tell it. I need to wear this watch some more. I'm gonna crush this. Hear me out. Hear me roar.